Hello everyone, how are you? Pastor Rod Plummer, we're doing a series on seven motivational gifts. And even if the gift I mentioned today is not yours, you will understand it. You will have people in your life that have this gift. It's called the gift of teaching. And to me, the gift of teaching is not being profound and having big words. The concept of teaching to me is breaking down truths, giving it to people in bite-sized chunks, they can receive it and assimilate it into their life. It's called the communication process. And the communication process says that in any communication, when I intend something and they don't receive it, it's called miscommunication. But when I intend something and they actually get it, aha, uh -huh, the aha uh -huh moment, the yeah, got it, whether it's in maths or athletics or science or language or Bible, uh, the people have the aha moment and they're able to assimilate it and then do it. And Jesus speaks a lot about this. People that, that hear my word and do it, they are the ones who are building their house upon a solid foundation. So the teaching ministry breaks things down, give it, gives it to people in simple chunks, and they get it for themselves. And I've got a simple illustration I often use that in the Bible there are some uh, complex concepts if it's like like that sort of a, a drawing, that's the concept. But some people want to make it more wordy, more difficult, more uh, whatever it is, because that they're a teacher and they've got to make it more like that. But I don't believe that. I believe the teaching process should make it more like this. And uh, just, just bear with me for one moment. And if you're watching, just if you're listening on the podcast, I'm just drawing some squiggles which comp which represents complexity but simplicity is like little bite-sized boxes or parts of truth that we can get assimilate and then this becomes part of our thinking and our lives this is called learning and i believe the teaching ministry is a god-given ministry to make things simple okay my key verse for this gift is 2 timothy 3 16 all scripture is god breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Now, all four of those things, I believe, are positives. Even the one that's more challenging or correcting, it's always about your, bed, your best future. The Father in heaven wants you to have a great life. He wants you to get his teaching, get his power, uh, get the word of God, Holy Spirit within, and walk in his ways. And it shouldn't be that difficult. It shouldn't be that difficult. And the teaching gift makes God's thoughts and words more easy. Okay, Romans 12, 3 to 8 is our key scripture. I'm going to read it out for us because it's all about giftings. Uh, there's seven gifts here, and it's talking about every gift is a gift of grace. A gift of grace. Okay, here we go. Romans 12, 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God distributes to each one of you. You've all got giftings from God. For just as each of us uh, has one body with many members, many arms, legs, fingers, whatever, or maybe not many legs too, <laughs> and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we though many form one body, each member belongs to all the others. And these seven gifts are not meant to live in isolation. They're meant to interact. It's called a team. It's called being in a, uh, a group, a team, um, a church, a connect group, a dream team. If it's in the church or in a, in, in a, in a work environment, it's colleagues, etc. So we're all meant to be part of a team. None of us is an island. Verse 6, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each one of us. Now, gifts and grace in the Greek are related words. One is charis, grace, and one is charisma, gifts. There's a third word, kairo, which means joy. These three words are connected in the Greek. Okay, I've already mentioned that. Let's move on. Here's the seven gifts. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. I call these people the early trend getters or the early creative uh, uh, seers, perceivers sort of thing. Number two, if it's serving, then serve. And last week I talked about these people kick up the dust. They're going to start a work do the work, process the work, and complete the work. They're process people. They're planners. We all need them in our lives. Number three is if your gift is teaching, then teach. Go ahead, teach. 
Number four, if it's encouraging, then give encouragement. Number five, if it's giving, then give generously. Number six, if it's to lead, do it quickly. And if it's to show mercy, do it with a happy heart, cheerfully. Okay, gift of teaching, some positives. I've got a a lot of positives because it's actually my gift. And of course, I'm going to be positive about my gift. Sorry about that. But you know, when you talk about your own gift, you should get pretty excited. Um, This is the gift I believe God's given me and I had to develop it and learn it and grow in it. And I still am. I'm, I'm committed to my gift of grace. Okay, positives is they like to keep it simple. They like to keep it simple. Number two, they like to make it accessible and achievable for all. Their their common thinking is anyone can do this, anyone can get this, at any moment you're going to get this. I remember when my my little boy uh, was, well, he's a big boy now, but when he was at school, he wasn't doing well in mass. He missed some foundational parts as we moved from Australia to Japan. And uh, he wasn't doing well in mass till he got a great teacher called Mrs. Mutenda. And she's an awesome lady. Uh, Viv and I really appreciate her because Monty started coming home more excited about maths and then more excited and he started saying, I'm getting it, I'm getting it. And then he started saying, I think it's more simple than I thought. And he ended up doing very well in maths. And I I said to him recently, what was it? He said, I I missed some foundations. And, And that year it was like foundations, simple little bits, like my simple illustration here, Uh, Instead of making it more difficult, she understood the gaps and gave me little bits of information that made the whole part of maths make sense. So positives is they want it. Teachers want this truth for everyone. It's not, you know, some people say, oh, it's so difficult. You need me to teach you. No, no, no. You need the word of God and some basic principles and some some helping connect group and you're going to get it. It's going to be accessible to all. Number three. It's not religious. Religious is complicated. Religious is legalistic. Religious is not motivating. It's not religious. And it's not trying to build a wow factor in my, wow, I'm under the greatest teacher in the world. It's not about the wow factor. It's the the wow factor is I'm getting it. I'm getting it. That's the wow factor. My teacher is helping me to get it. Number four is they like to reproduce it. The proof is in the pudding. And as a pastor and leader for many years, Um, My greatest thrill has been seeing people um, really get spiritual truths and start saying things like, wow, I I love God more because of this truth, or this is happening in my life now and I'm starting to see financial breakthroughs or relationship breakthroughs, or our marriage is getting better, or I'm getting healthier, or the, the proof is in the pudding. If people look good, they've probably got good teaching. If people look sick, I, I don't mean physically sick, I mean sick in soul. And it says this in Proverbs that the, the, the uh, you know God's word is like a healthy medicine, uh, but when we have dry bones, we're sick. And, and I think that the proof is in the pudding and teaching. You know, Jesus often uh, spoke about the sheep and the shepherd, and and obviously in Psalm twenty three, it's a big biblical picture. And the picture is, if the sheep is healthy, you need to look and say the shepherd must be healthy. The teaching must be healthy. The words, the the field, the the grass is, is good. The you know, healthy sheep are under healthy shepherds. And when you look at people who are not doing well, you think, well, there's maybe something wrong with the, the, the shepherd or the teaching. Uh, this sounds harsh, but I, I've always been under great teachers. And I've, I've developed a sense of healthy teaching when people are really there for you. The, the, the teaching that people are giving is for you. You're going to advance. You're going to grow. You're Marriage is going to get better. The motivation is never personal. Never, ever. The teacher's motivation is never to develop followers. The leader's motive, the teacher's motivation is that you would get truth and live an amazing life. Okay. Number four, five. They love to find a difficult way and make it easy. It's a process. I call it the, uh, you get a bit of truth and it might be a bit complex, but you squeeze it and you think it and you work it and you squeeze it and squeeze it and at the bottom comes a little bit of truth it's it's the same old truth that was ever there it's not new truth it's just the way i can present this with pictures metaphors illustrations that you would then look at something and say aha i get it i get it that thank you for making that very simple and as a pastor over many years i've had actually some people say to me uh, oh that was that was so simple 
uh, Pastor Rod. I, uh, that was so simple. And it's, it, it's not meant as a compliment, but I always take it as a compliment. And I say, oh, thank you. Thank you. you you're saying my teaching is simple. Thank you so much. Hey, let's do it. Let's do it. Because teaching is not about just being simple. It's doing things well is what Proverbs is all about. I'm talking about Proverbs in a little while. You know, I, I think about this and over time I watch people make stories and illustrations to to show people how simple this truth is. One of the great complex truths of the Bible is the Trinity, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and, and God the Son, Jesus Christ. And some people go into this theological uh, rigmarole, you know, uh, Jesus is the, you know, the 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 revelationary impartation of the and they're using big words and and people go it's complex but i love when i went to ireland and heard about st patrick who was an amazing um uh pastor um evangelist missionary from ireland and and really impacted europe and and what he did is he took the simple little flower in or plant in the in ireland called the three leaf clover clover It's just a simple little plant. You might have seen it's very green and it's got three parts. And he picks it up and says, this is God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit pointing to one of the three little petals. And that became such a simple illustration to people to understand that God is one, but with three parts or three uh, revelationary um, parts to his nature. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Um, today we might use a, another analogy for to try and make it simple, the concept of God one but three. And I've heard one illustration is the concept of water. I've got my coffee here. It's um, uh, it's not so hot at the moment because I've been talking, but um, this is liquid in here. If you can see, it's just it's just coffee. Um, uh, if I was to reboil that and and steam comes off, that's still it's still water. Um, in fact, it's 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 uh, actually more pure water than coffee. It it, it would it, it's evaporating back into H two O. Or if I was to take water, take liquid, and freeze it, it becomes ice. So it's still H two O, but in three different forms. And that's the way I would explain to people about the Trinity: God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It may not be the whole answer, but finally people start saying, "Aha! It's the one essence, but in three different revelations or three different." Um, environments we see now god can be god the father god the son jesus and god the holy spirit so the teachers love to try and make analogies pictures illustrations that people have the aha moment um that's actually my next point that was point six they they see in stories analogies rhythms and seasons of learning and last thing i want to say is that they're not into secret learning which is also called gnostic teaching or hey come over here, I've got the special secret learning. No, 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 no. That very clearly in the New Testament, Paul unveiled everything he could. And he said, I pray that you might have a spirit of wisdom and understanding to get the, the basics. And and, and uh, in, in the book of Acts, it said that the, that the teachers and prophet, uh, prophet, uh, prophets and apostles taught and all the people enjoyed the word and, and the word grew. So again, the proof is in the pudding, pudding with good teaching. Cup, just to areas the teaching gift needs attention one don't blame the people when they don't get it we've lived in japan for many years and i've heard many people say foolish things such as our oh, japanese christians don't learn very fast and I, I i we never ever believed that or accepted that that is not true so that the issue is if people are not getting truth it's not their fault it's not their fault it's the teacher's fault it's my fault I'm not saying it's your fault. I'm saying if I don't relate well, it's my fault. And I have to think and pray and squeeze and work and understand how that truth, unchanged, becomes accessible to the wonderful, beautiful Japanese people. And we've seen thousands of people saved and baptized in Japan in these 18 years, realizing there were some parts that were very, uh, were, were seeming to be very complex, but when we made them simple, the Japanese people had the aha moment, aha. So that's what grace is. And grace is one of the most difficult things here in Asia. We lived also in Thailand, and, there, and there's not even a, a, a great word in Thai for the word grace. 
in Japan, the word grace is, is more kindness, which is a good word. Megumi, beautiful word. But the concept of grace as being, I get it from God, but I don't deserve it. That concept has been difficult. So we've had to really break it down into stories, uh, testimonies, illustrations, preaching, teaching, until the Japanese people said, ah, so I don't have to do anything to repay God. It's a free gift. And and I, I, I want to say it's not just Japanese and Thai people. I think people in Australia, my country, and all countries do have trouble with the concept of grace. So the teacher thinks through that, says, how do we, how do we get this and present it to the people? So don't blame the people when they get stuck. Let's work at our communication, our analogies, our pictures, our, illustra- our illustrations. I think I said that twice. Um, own the problem myself as a teacher. And the other thing I need to say is that teachers often need patience. They need to see where people are stuck, like my, my story of my little boy learning maths and Mrs. Mutenda helped Monty, helped him to get the gaps filled with the basics in mathematics. She had patience with him, and I want to have patience with people. In other words, don't get annoyed when people get stuck. Just rethink, repray, help again, be a great connect group leader, and help fill the knowledge gap or the area like grace that's a problem area. Um, I, I, in fact, as a teacher with a teaching gift, when I see that, it, I've got to be inspired to help. And, uh, and my third area needs attention is because I have this gift, I've learned in marriage that I can't always teach my wife, ha, 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 right? Or if you're a lady married you, and you're teaching gift, you can't always teach your husband. So when I come home, I've had to learn to turn off my teaching gift. I'm not my wife's teacher. <laughs> and we've had to learn that over years of uh, great but negotiated marriage in our different gifts. And, and we've got a great marriage now after being married for 35 years. God is good. Okay, I want to give you some examples. Old Testament, the New Testament. Old Testament example, I'm not going to go into it, but Moses came off the mountains with 10 commandments. Now, actually, as you read Exodus and Deuteronomy, the second law giving, the, there are many, many more than 10 commandments. In fact, there's hundreds, but um, it's summarized as 10 commandments. I think summary is a picture of good teaching. When I hear people uh, whether it's we, I used to be in sales, marketing, and in pastoring, and I hear people being over over wordy. I, I've often said to them, "You need to learn the gift of summary. You need to take that big story and make it short." When people say, "Ah, oh, I, I I got a story and um, I'm going to try and make it short," I, I I sort of say, "Well, okay, let let's do that," um, because I've realised that people can become very wordy. Actually, people probably with a gift of teaching at the beginning are very wordy. Probably I was too. And so learning the gift of summary doesn't mean you don't have the gift of teaching. It just means we have to learn the gift of summary, especially with a connect group, a small group, um, a teaching ministry of some sort. If If you're with children, you need the gift of summary. You need to tell a story well and tell it short so that children can understand. It's great communication to teach to children. Um, okay, Old Testament. Let me also give you the example of the book of Proverbs. I, I mentioned earlier the book of Proverbs. Now, the book of Proverbs is written, written by a few people, but mainly by King Solomon. And let me tell you that that little book with 31 chapters, 31 chapters is full of two little line sayings, which is a proverb. A proverb is a, a short, pithy, powerful saying, but the word proverb also means to rule and reign in life. It, they're, they're, they're little sayings that stick and make us grab them and and give us a bit of a compass towards success. Very powerful, the Proverbs. And they were written by the what, what um, the, the Bible calls, you know, such a, a wise man, King Solomon, who got wisdom from God. Now, Proverbs is 31 chapters. Each chapter is comprised of about 20 to 35 individual two-line sayings or two-line um, poetic groupings which means the little book of Proverbs has 600 bits of wisdom. 
And and honestly, you could read Proverbs in a few hours or you, in a few years because there's so much in each little saying to think through, to think, wow, there's so much power pack in this little saying. I um, I love that. I, I also love uh, some modern Christian teaching books on leadership by John Maxwell and uh, Dave Ramsey with finance and um, Zig Ziglar in sales and Christian teachers. Uh, John Bevere, love him in uh, in the area of uh, having a great heart and Joyce Myers in renewing the mind. And, and these are great teachers. I know they're not the Old Testament, but I sort of jumped. Okay, But I think that they're taking all their principles from Proverbs. Everyone has taken Proverbs, looked at it. How can we reframe that for um, people's lives today? They're not changing the word of God. They're extrapolating or taking a teaching point from Proverbs. And that's why I love good Christian teaching books, because they're taking God's word and applying it for our lives. New Testament example, of course, is going to be Jesus. Um, every you know, if you get a, a Bible with a, a red letter edition like like this this one here, it's a um, good old good old paper Bible of mine. I love it. I still love reading paper Bible, although mostly my reading is digital. Um, but the, the words of Jesus are in red, which you don't have to have that. But when you realize how much wisdom and teaching is in here, we we could slow down and just our lives would be changed by the teaching. Of Jesus, I'll give you some examples of how Jesus really is a brilliant teacher. In fact, let me just read this to you um, in Matthew chapter seven, verse twenty-eight, twenty-nine. When he's teaching, the people are amazed. It says, "When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowd were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law." So, comparison, teachers of the law, the proof is in the pudding. People were under legalism; it wasn't going well. Jesus comes along, probably summarizes God's word, um, which I'm going to explain in a minute. Um, God's word from the Old Testament makes it short and and, and attainable, uh, accessible, gettable. Um, and the people go, aha, and they, this, this is a great teacher. I'll give you two examples. One, Jesus was asked, who is the greatest or who is the, who is the best or the whatever. Matthew 18, 1, who's the greatest? Verse 4. At that time, um, the, the disciples came. Sorry, I'm going to read the whole thing. Uh, Matthew 18, 1 to 4. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him. That's called an object lesson. See this child. And placed the child among them, experiential learning, and said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, I think he's probably pointing now, you, plural, will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child, pointing to the child, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes such one child in my name welcomes me. Wow, application. Love children, accept children, don't treat them as if they're nothing. No, I love kids church. I love kids church teachers. If you're a teacher in kids church, you are preparing for the greatest adventure of your life, teaching wonderful kids. And those little kids have the aha moment and their parents are thankful. And uh, those little kids often say later, um, I couldn't remember everything in kids church, but I know that God was good. And I know, and they'll, stay, they'll say a few things that, that, that really started at a very young age. Um, and Jesus is saying, we need to have a heart just like that, learning, growing, um, applying, loving God. The second example is um, the question, what's the greatest commandment in the Old Testament? So as I look at the Old Testament, there's you know thousands of words and, whoa, uh, so many pages. Um, and Jesus was said, okay, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment in the Old Testament? Let me read it to you, uh, Matthew 22, 35. One of, the, one of them, an expert in the law, so a, a renowned teacher, tested Jesus with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? What's the greatest commandment of the whole Old Testament? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets, Old Testament, hang on these two 
commandments. Wow, that's great teaching, Jesus. Thank you so much that we must see the Old Testament through the eyes of love God and love your neighbor. Wow, isn't that good teaching? So every time I'm reading Old Testament, whether it's law or poetry, I've got to be thinking of Jesus and I've got to be thinking what he said, that the the, the purpose is to love God with all my heart and all my strength and to love you and other people. And the same for you as well when we read the Old Testament. Wow, thank you, Jesus. You are the most amazing teacher, and I've learned so much from you. Now, the whole New Testament, the Apostle Paul wrote 13 books of the New Testament. So let me give you Paul's teaching gift. Paul's teaching gift. He was obviously a teacher and a, well, we're not sure whether he wrote all these books. He would have had a a a mansuensis, I think it's called, a a secretary with him, a writer. Uh, Probably when he's in jail, he wrote, with a, a guy like that, Philippians and um, some of the other books. But it was Paul's thoughts from the Holy Spirit, a very clever man. Now, what did Paul say about love? Jesus said, whole Old Testament, love God, love people. Paul, 1 Corinthians thirteen nine, the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covenant, you shall not covet, which means don't want other people's stuff, and whatever other commands there may be, other commands, are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, Jesus said the second commandment is like the first, because as I love God, I will love my neighbor more. As I love God, I will love my wife more. As I love God, I will I will love and, and forgive and give and bless others more. So Paul's summarizing it as that. He does the same in Galatians 5.14. The entire law is fulfilled in keeping one command, love your neighbor as yourself. So he's giving us summary, essence, the, the concept of the whole Old Testament. Let's not make it more complex. Let's break it down. And the overriding theme is to love God, love your neighbor as yourself, applying it to my life. Now read the Old Testament with clear summary eyes. In fact, it's all about Jesus and how God works in our life. Okay, one more example from Paul, and then I'll talk about in in our church. The essence of the gospel. What's the essence, the the middle part of the, the gospel message? Well, Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 15, 2 to 3. He says, by this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Hey, he's saying, hey, you've got to hold this gospel. What's the gospel, Paul? For I received what I passed on to you as of first importance, priority, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and he appeared to many, including 500 at one time. This is Paul's summary. This is not the whole New Testament. Paul wrote 13 books. But what he's saying is in in all your reading of the New Testament, don't lose sight of the good news, which is all about Christ dying for us according to the Old Testament scriptures, the prophecies, the the images, the Psalms, the, 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 the messianic prophecies. According to the scriptures, Christ died for us. For all of us, he was buried, he was really dead, and he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that when we read complex or semi complex things, which the Bible can have some, let's not make it more difficult, let's make it more simple. And some people say, Are you dumbing down the gospel? Absolutely not. I want people to get it and then apply it in their own lives. And let me say clearly that my role as a teacher pastor is not to have people depend upon me, but for me to bring them to God's word and an understanding, a clear understanding of Bible truths that they can read the Bible for themselves, get revelation over time, read journal, take notes, what God is saying to them from the age-old truths, but apply today. That's a big statement, but that's my role, 
is to lead you uh, and help you. If I'm your pastor, if I'm not, then obviously in your church, someone else, um, connect group leader, dream team leader, some really good teacher to to get the to 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 get the tools to get the truths to live a great life. And just let me finish by saying examples from my life of great teachers. You see, as a very young believer, I saw great teachers and it inspired me. And obviously I linked, I said, I want to do that. That's, that's inspiring. That's great. Because I had that gift in seed form. Seed form wasn't developed, but it had the gift of, by grace. So let me tell you about my very first connect group leader in Sydney. His name is Daniel Mays. And I was, in, I was in a connect group with people. I was a young salesman um, and um, I was learning some skills. And uh, Daniel was just an amazing guy, great young business guy and him and his wife. And um, just, in fact, when I first met them, they were not yet married. They were in the connect group and they, they married Christian people, loved the Lord. But I, I learned so much about Daniel um, as he um, shared the Bible and asked questions, said, uh, you know, Jenny, what do you think about that? And, oh, okay, well, what about this? And and I learned question asking and involvement. And when someone was a little bit wrong or off, like me, <laughs> uh, Daniel would not say that's wrong, but he'd say, well, how about this scripture? And we'd read it. And I'd go, oh, thank you. And I would learn the concept of inductive Bible studies, being involved in the process of learning how to read the Bible for myself. And um, over that year or two, all I said in my heart was, I want to run one of these connect groups one day. I love Daniel. And there was a time when I could run my own connect group and it really grew. And um, that's for another time. My first connect group was full of some amazing people. Well, they were all amazing, but some were very broken and hurt and some were very amazing right from the beginning. And um, anyway, out of that came great business leaders and even pastors and Amazing. It was just great. Um, but I learned from a great leader, and I believe we all should be under a great local church leader. A second person I want to talk about is great teacher is Pastor Chris Hodges, Church of the Highlands in Birmingham, Alabama. A few years ago in our church, we felt that we needed to simplify some of our processes here in Tokyo um, and Lifehouse. We were doing great, but we really felt, Viv and I felt we needed something simple. And so we came across uh, what they use, they use, they call it the grow track. And they said, Rod, you can take this and change it for Japan. And so we've called it the grow course just because it sounds easier. And in here are four simple little principles from our church, um, four, four steps. You can get this online. It's PDF. If we come back on in physical services, any of our 50 um, campuses goes physical at the end of coronavirus, you'll be able to get one of these physically. But right now, you just go to our website, Grow Course, download the PDF, and you can do this. And included in this is um, this seven gift assessment. There's no right or wrong answers, but you will discover your gift and how you can serve the Lord. But we got this from Pastor Chris Hodges, and he had traveled through America and South America, researching the simplest, most wonderful teaching and put it in his, uh, what they call the growth track. And when we heard it, and uh, we, we, my son Monty and uh, our youth pastor Masashi and others went to America, they came back and said, Dad, Mom, well, Monty said that, um, you've got to see this stuff. This is really what we've been looking for. Viv and I looked at it, changed a few things for Japan, not much. But I want to really give honor to Pastor Chris Hodges as a man who brings such such simplicity to something that's a little bit complex, needs explanation. He is masterful at one-liners um, to make things simple. So we, we're very thankful for great teachers. And um, finally, I want to say my teaching team, my pastors in Lifehouse are amazing teachers. They're teaching people how to um, journal, how to hear the voice of God for themselves, read the Bible with meaning, how to pray simply and effectively, how to learn the rhythms of forgiveness. Uh, we call it clean heart at night. Just forgive people at night before you sleep, have a good sleep. Um, 
the basics of church life, our dream team leaders, you are amazing as you lead teams in sound and lighting and online and blogs and, and video editing and uh, pastoring. And uh, thank you so much to the dream teams. And uh, there are teaching. Now, not all teaching is actually Bible study, although that's the origin. But a lot of it is life-giving. This is how we forgive. This is how we work together. This is how we work our gifts together in the local church. So as I finish, I have this gift. I'm committed to it. I'm 61 and I'm still committed to learning and growing all about this process. Lord, how can I take your wonderful truths and present it to people that they have the aha moment, integrate it, and it actually becomes part of their life. That is my greatest joy in life. Now, I am a pastor. Most of you are not, but if you have this gift, you have that passion. Don't make it difficult, make it simple and attainable that people go, aha, I got it. Let me pray. Lord, I pray that those with this gift would be excited, learning, growing, developing. Those that maybe don't or are are in seed form, they'd be praying, Lord, help me to be part of a team where there is good teaching, there is good growth in your word, and I will play a part of it with my seeking you and journaling and getting words and being part of the whole process of people growing in the local church. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you. That was gift number three. We're heading to gift four next week. God bless you.